Um, uh, Mr. Kirkin, do you want me to transfer now? Uh, oui, s'il vous plaît, vous pouvez transférer tous les, les appels de la téléconférence. Merci, Jacob. Merci de rien. Ah, C'est bon, on commence. Oui, vous pouvez started? commencer, Monsieur Miller. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Miller. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Bonjour. I want to start by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the traditional territory of the Algonquin people. And I want to thank in particular those who shared their stories and approaches today over the last two days, in fact, on um, a difficult topic of anti-Indigenous racism in the healthcare system. Systemic racism resulting from Canada's colonial history remains embedded in our country's healthcare systems and continues to have catastrophic effects on First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities. For too many, uh, this is the systemic racism and discrimination in, in our institutions, and especially when seeking health care, is a lived daily experience. The fact that systemic racism among Indigenous peoples in Canada has become normalized is not acceptable, and action is long overdue. Without significant change, Indigenous peoples will continue to face harmful and persistent inequities in their health and social outcomes. While governments and the healthcare leaders have been meeting over these last two days, we have the opportunity to draw people's attention and to discuss what is a societal issue, an infringement of human rights and basic Canadian values, anti Indigenous racism in healthcare. What Joyce Echaquan experienced was not an isolated in incident. Many Canadians have expressed their indignation and incredulity. Many Indigenous people were not surprised because they themselves have been victims or witness to serious racism in the healthcare environment. Joyce's tragic story calls upon us to pay tribute to her heritage, like the Atikamek in Manwan, and the uh, Joyce's principle identifies measures needed in all healthcare systems, including by federal and provincial, provincial and territorial governments to fight against race, anti-Indigenous racism, in healthcare, recognizing their leadership, the government of leadership, the government of Canada uh, gave two hundred million dollars to uh, to the Atikamek community. We must move forward concretely with a collective commitment to change the way we do things. We will implement the necessary changes to eliminate all forms of racism in our healthcare systems. Speech from the throne pledged to address systemic racism and committed to do so in a way informed by the lived experiences of racialized communities, including Indigenous peoples. My recent mandate letter committed to also continuing the important work to address anti Indigenous racism in the healthcare system. And most recently, the fall economic statement proposed an investment of $15.6 million over two years to support the co development of distinctions based health legislation with First Nations, Inuit, and Metis partners. Until today, alongside representatives from organizations representing First Nations, Inuit, and the Metis Nation, I'm pleased to announce, I was pleased to announce the launch of the process to support the co-development of Indigenous health legislation. And I'm very much looking forward to working in partnership with rights holders, including treaty rights holders. This important initiative will advance efforts to transform healthcare delivery in Indigenous communities by ensuring Indigenous control over the development and delivery of healthcare services, and it will be informed by the work we do here. The federal government will also continue to supporting Indigenous peoples' representation in the healthcare field and targeted anti racism training and skills development. We'll work collaboratively with Indigenous partners to develop and share tools and resources to increase knowledge of Indigenous practices and ways of being. We'll also continue to examine how we support healthcare systems to ensure we're working collaboratively to strengthen patient safety. The reports have been done on these issues, including the National Inquiry into the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, in Plain Sight's report most recently, and the Commission Vienne report. They will all be used to inform discussions and plans of action. Significantly, as representatives of the federal government, we will continue to hold roundtables and large forums like this one to continue the dialogue, to monitor progress, cross actions, and to share information on best practices, necessary steps, and key accomplishments. Systemic racism is a problem that is national in scope. 
There's no vaccine against it. We remain fully committed to continuing the fight to remove the obstacles to equitable, culturally safe, community-led, community-driven, and distinctions-based approaches to healthcare. Miigwech, Nakumik, merci, Marci Cho, thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, to my colleagues um, and also to everyone who participated in this very important forum. Uh, obviously, people participated with a high degree of vulnerability, honesty, transparency, integrity, and it was really, um, you know, I think uh, moving to hear people's experiences, personal experiences and professional experiences, um, both as practitioners and as individuals uh, interacting with healthcare systems across all, all levels of government. And I will say a big thank you to the provinces and territories that were able to participate and that uh, either sent ministers or deputy ministers. It's so important that we uh, have political leadership as well as uh, institutional leadership hearing these stories. And I think, you know, one of the things I heard over and over, and certainly uh, I will say that uh, I, I share this frustration is that we've talked about this issue for a very long time, in, it, it really in community and at all levels of government. And there are hundreds of reports uh, on ending systemic racism in healthcare, on improving outcomes for patients that are racialized, in particular Indigenous people. And, you know, I think one thing that I heard clearly from all participants was this is the time to act. Uh, I will say that there um, uh, was a com you know a complete acknowledgement. I think by all all participants that what we're doing is not working uh, for Indigenous people. That we continue to have incidents like like in like the incident that Joyce Eshelquandros happened to capture on film before she died. You know this is not an uncommon experience actually for Indigenous people. It's common. It's regular, and it not only creates unequal levels of care, it creates actually barriers to care. Uh, prior to politics, I spent many years working in community and most recently before being elected amongst Indigenous people that were experiencing homelessness. And I can tell you that one of the more frightening places for people to interact that were Indigenous, that were living in poverty, that often were living with a, a variety of different medical issues, was the healthcare system. And so this was not shocking to me as, as a, someone who's worked in community before, but I will say it's saddening that it continues and it can, can continues without abatement. From my perspective, what this what has to happen is that there has to be a transformation of power. And you know, we talk about oftentimes laying on modules onto what exists. And I think some of the most powerful comments that I heard was the need for transformation from within. And that it doesn't uh, it isn't about teaching you know, through a series of courses, cultural competence or, uh, you know, cultural sensitivity or cultural safety. And, you know, there are a variety of different uh, kinds of courses and modules that, that are applied in this context, but that many of the participants felt really came short of actually truly sharing knowledge and power. And so today I'm very excited to announce that the federal government is investing $4 million in a national consortium for Indigenous medical education. This consortium is led by Indigenous physicians in partnership with the Association of Faculties of Medicine of Canada, the Indigenous Physicians Association of Canada, the College of Family Physicians of Canada, the Medical Council of Canada, and the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. And the consortium will provide that leadership and implement Indigenous-led projects with the goal to reform and update the education of physicians to contribute to ensure Indigenous peoples have access to care that is indeed culturally safe and free from discrimination. So there is action happening. There are leaders in communities and in, in the Indigenous communities that are that are taking up the mantle of change and have the opportunity with the support of the federal government to actually lead that change from within. So thank you very much for uh, again having us today and I will say that I thank all the participants who again so freely shared their experiences in the spirit and the hope that this time there will be transformational change. Thank you uh, Mark and Patty and uh... I'm uh, speaking to you from my home in Toronto on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas, the credit where we honor all the Indigenous peoples uh, who paddled these waters and whose moccasins walked these lands.
Merci à tous, uh, ceux qui ont Thank you to everyone who participated in the last two days. We are all recognize Carol Dubé, the uh, widower of Joyce Echequan, for joining us in the discussions and for defending Joyce's principal, principal rather, so that we could effect true change. I think that the words of, uh, and I wish all Canadians could have could have listened to to really the inspiring words. And I think the wise and inspiring Carol Hopkins made it clear that that our first responsibility is to ensure a future for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis, and ensure a future of hope. As yesterday, Ed, uh, the elder Edmund Sakine reminded us that listening is the first sign of love. And I think that in our October meeting, we listened uh, to the truths of the providers and the patients and the learners. And as well as it's, uh, it's important for us all to listen, because when you hear the stories, you only then can truly understand how our systems are making Indigenous people feel, how the health outcomes are unacceptable, and how bad experiences yeah. make Indigenous patients reluctant to access timely care. So these past two days fo focused on the solutions, on the concrete actions, as, uh, as was asked, what is the moccasin path? So Dr. Karen Hill reminded us, as, as Patty has said, that, that tinkering around the outsides is not going to work. She reminded us we have to rethink the whole thing, the years of all the same words, and Joyce is dead at the hands of our system. It's not working. So she's advised it's time to get out of the box and reminded that the system is not broken. It was built this way. The colonial views of knowing best are not working. And it's powerful to, to know that we have to support the building of Indigenous health systems together on the path to self-determination, where their knowledge keepers and healers will be a part of improving primary care and public health. As grandmother Catherine Whitecloud reminded us about the social determinants of health, the role in prevention and thinking seven generations out. So I think we, we know, and it was clear, that we need more Indigenous health human resources and professionals. That means more nurses, nurse practitioners, midwives, and doctors. But we also need that to make sure that the secondary and tertiary systems are safe spaces for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. The points of care have to have zero tolerance for racism. So Dr. Lisa Richardson, really has been clear that we have to do more on the education, but we have to have the data and we have to have real structures of accountability and governance. So this, this afternoon, we also heard about the need to recognize the importance of distinctions-based First Nations, Inuit and Métis, but also the intersectionality of the two-spirit and gender diverse, the persons with disabilities and the strong voices of the youth who also want to make sure that the knowledge keepers and their elders have a role to play in, in a new system. And, and, that, and that Dr. Marlon Cook, the first Indigenous physician, was very clear how walking in both worlds, the role of the knowledge keepers and Indigenous governance is going to be so important. Dr. Margaret Greenwood from the National Collaborating Center on Indigenous Health asked us yesterday afternoon, what would the system look like? The vision of First Nations Inuit Métis Health. And I'm really pleased that the National Center, Collaborating Center on Indigenous House Health will now house the repository of the wise practices in cultural humility and cultural safety. So I think we're all very grateful for the government's but also the colleges and the accreditation bodies for the work that they have done to begin to er eradicate racism in that they also have levers and powers to actually deal with zero tolerance. 
So as you know, the TRC call to action 24 asks for the education of professionals, particularly nurses and doctors, the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, and the ongoing development of the National Action Plan, including our federal component, is very much part of this journey. And as we heard from Mary Ellen Terpelafon yesterday, that as we implement UNDRIP, that, that that action plan really has to focus on Article 24, which states Indigenous individuals have an equal right to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. States shall take the necessary steps with a view to achieving progressively the full realization of this right. So uh, we agree with Richard Jock, who said we need creative disruption. And I personally thank Dr. Makokas for bringing together such an inspiring group of colleagues grounded in their language and culture who since March have shared every Thursday night the experience of their patients, themselves, and their relatives struggling in the medical education systems as well. So we're grateful for the candor and courage, uh, the vision and values, and I think this evening we remember Brian Sinclair we remember Asada Tikkutvik, we remember Joyce Eshekwan, and we are committed to working together to stop these tragedies. Miigwech, Marcy, Nakamik. Thank you, ministers. We will now answer questions from journalists. And with one question and one follow-up question. One question and one follow-up. Operator, uh, over to you. Thanks. Thank you. Merci. Please press star one at this time if you have a question. S'il vous plaît, appuyez sur étoile un maintenant pour poser une question. And the first question, la première question, is to Christy Kirkup from the Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. La parole est à vous. Hi, good evening. Thanks, ministers, uh, for taking the questions. Um, I just wanted to start off by asking what um, provinces were represented in the discussion. There was a reference to some provinces. So um, what provinces um, and territories participated in the discussion that happened over the last two days? Kirsty, I, I can, unless um, Minister Bennett or Minister Haidu has, has a more complete list, the, the list I have, um, it, you know, first of all, Christy, that, that over the last two days, there's been about 500 or so participants that have fluctuated from, you know, high, high mid 400s to 500. Um, so um, very many participants from all walks of life, which is really, really encouraging um, in terms of representation from, from the provincial and territorial governments. All levels were represented to various degrees um, and, 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 and that, that we can confirm with with the list, um, there were speakers on the last day that included all um, all provinces, with um, with the exception of Alberta and Newfoundland. Um, Minister Dix from British Columbia took um, took some time to offer some words, um, very poignant ones about point of care. Um, Minister Yann Lafreniere from Quebec uh, took the opportunity to to speak about the work that he has pledged to do in Quebec uh, to to uh, to weed out racism in the healthcare system, um, from the from the Yukon, the Honorable Pauline Frost took part, um, and Northwest Territories, uh, the Honorable Julie Green, um, from Nunavut, the Honorable Lauren uh, Kusugak, um, and from Prince Edward Island, um, the Honorable James Haleward, I believe. And if I haven't, if I've missed out anyone of, of any elected officials, um, perhaps um, the Parliamentary Secretary from Ontario, Parliamentary Assistant to the Minister of Health, I apologize, so not an elected officials. But um, members of the civil service, um, I suspect we can provide you with a list. Thank you very much. And uh, sorry for the quiz uh, nature of that question. But the reason I'm asking, of course, about the provinces and territories is I'm just trying to get a measure of how committed uh, do the provinces and territories seem in terms of their role in ensuring that systemic racism is not playing out within um, healthcare systems that uh, fall under the purview of uh, provincial governments. Um, well, no, no, knowing the number of jurisdictions that we have, um, you know, it, it, it does vary. Um, clearly, um, Br British Columbia, that has been 
really at the forefront in tackling um, in, in walking together with Indigenous peoples um, along the path of reconciliation was present through, and the words of Adrian Dix uh, certainly testified to that. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I think all the provinces are in good faith in wanting to tackle racism and its effects on, on Indigenous peoples. Um, we, we do need increased commitments in, in a jurisdiction that is, um, that is primarily provincial. Um, but that is, that, that's not something that was new to this conference. Um, I think the work that we've all identified by listening to the people that have actually experienced it. I mean, look, you're talking to a person who, is, who has never experienced any of the issues that were highlighted over the last two days. Um, so um, that, that is probably the case for a number of the provincial partners that were listening. So this was an opportunity to get that feedback and, and to say and to work with Indigenous peoples to, to, to get their feedback. They all know that um, we can all sit there and make lofty statements, but they will want um, they will want action in, in, in the long term, in the medium term and in the short term. And I think that's what we've pledged to our territorial and provincial partners to, to frankly hold each other to account. Um, the reports are there. I've named them. People have read them. Um, the specific clauses that Minister Bennett referred to in um, in the United Nations Declaration of the Rights uh, of Indigenous Peoples are there. Um, Indigenous Peoples are looking for us to be accountable and to apply them. And um, in the cases of 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 of, of their medicines, to allow them the space to practice. Um, the difficulty is when you uh, is when you work on the intersection between those practices um, and and. To, to treat them on an equal basis, which we haven't done to, up to now. I'm, I'm going on on, on, a, on a longer point than you asked, Kirsty, as I tend to do, but um, there is an eagerness. I, I, I certainly uh, don't exclude trepidation. I think we're all out of our comfort zone. Um, we all know uh, the impact that this is having on Indigenous peoples. There's reports out there to prove it, um, but there's a willingness to do it, and that's what I think gives me hope. I don't know, Carolyn or, or Patty, whether you want to add more on that. Listen, um, uh, I think I'll, I'll just add. I think. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Do you want me to go first, Carolyn? I'll just continue. Um, so, listen, uh, it's a great question, and it's one that I think the participants ask themselves. I mean, there is a difference between. Um, saying the right words and then doing the hard work of changing systems, like I mentioned in my opening remarks, that often require more than tweaking on the edges. And I can just tell you, as a you know, someone who, as I mentioned, worked in community, that um, the idea that we can somehow get to this with uh, you know uh, cultural safety training or cultural sensitivity training without a consistent and sustained um, effort at organizational levels to have increased Indigenous voices leading uh, at all levels of the organization, a focused effort to employ Indigenous people in healthcare settings, uh, a variety of different healthcare settings, uh, changes in curriculum like the funding that I announced today that um, allows for a more comprehensive integration of Indigenous principles in, in healthcare and in healing. I think, you know, the fact that people were there today is a good sign. Uh, it's the next steps that matter, and what matters is that uh, that 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 uh, desire. And I do believe that everyone does have a desire to have a system that's more inclusive gets translated into tangible action. And I can tell you by watching the work of organizations in my own community, it is it is hard, it is sustained, and it needs a sustained commitment at the most senior levels of leadership. Yes, I, I think that again, that, uh, that with uh, Minister Dix, but also Mary Ellen Trapelafon's, uh, um, you know, significant report that she as she shared uh, yesterday, and the fact that next week will be her data report. I mean, they they listened to over nine thousand people, um, and had because of the the disgusting. Um, uh, revelation around the bingo game um, in, in last mid last year. The fact that 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 significant piece of work was done in six months um, with really strong recommendations for everybody, I, I think, speaks to to um, taking that piece of work and then and then hopefully there are some federal. Um, 
things that we are obviously working on, but also that other provinces and territories will look to, to be able to see what they could um, learn from that report and apply and in, in tweak in their own jurisdiction. Thanks, and I Christy. think, uh, oh. I think Christy, the other thing is that, as you heard, that the Royal College, the College of Family Practice, Accreditation Canada, all, you know, all of the 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 colleges of physicians and surgeons want to know how they can do better in including Indigenous peoples in the in the accreditation, but also in terms of up the the evaluation and consequences of bad behavior. Thanks, Christy. Um, operator, next question. Thank you. The next question, la prochaine question, is of Brett Forrester from APTN National News. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hello, ministers. Based on these preliminary meetings, what might this distinctions-based Indigenous health legislation looks like? Look like, pardon me. Hi, Brett. Um, well, uh, uh, perhaps, uh, as you know, that in, in both throne speeches of this government, this has been mentioned. Um, it's something that we 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 knew we had to undertake when I when I sat down with my team after being uh, appointed Indigenous Services Minister um, a little over a year ago, um, we had extensive briefings on, on the process that we needed to follow in order to, uh, to move forward on, 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 uh, on this, knowing um, the jealously guarded jurisdiction that we were, as well as the, you know, the political minefield that it represented, if you look at any of the historical relations with, that we've had with, with provinces um, over healthcare. Um, we know that this is a system that has failed Indigenous peoples uh, in a country that we pride ourselves on having a first-class healthcare med med medical system that has failed and treated Indigenous peoples as second-class citizens. We know that. It, it's been exacerbated by COVID. Um, and so when I sat down, going back a year before COVID, a little over a year, knowing what, you know, the challenges that we had faced with C91 and C92 in terms of engagement and co-developing, I wanted my team to take as, as much time as possible to sit down and talk to treaty partners um, uh, who, who often have different perspectives depending on their treaty areas, uh, rights holders of various nature. So really have a long diligence process. Um, the historical epidemic has, has, has increased the urgency of moving forward on this, knowing that um, the socio-determinants of health that have led to the outcomes that we've seen, um, particularly as tangibly measured in the South to um, Indigenous peoples that are three and a half to five times at risk to the exposure of COVID, um, the challenges that we have with respect to housing, which is that you know, congregated living spaces are a vector of transmission of the disease. These are all issues that have made this discussion uh, very much, <laughs> very much um, something that is present of mind that we need to move a little quicker on. So forgive me if I don't have all the answers, particularly in 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 in, in knowing um, what I do over the last year, knowing that when it comes to the particular issue at hand that we've been discussing in systemic racism and racism, I myself have never experienced it with respect to the healthcare system. So this will be a longer process. We've dedicated a good amount of, um, of financing in 15 and a half million dollars to start that engagement with rights holders to ensure that whatever we come up with uh, reflects those voices, and there will be there will be varying views on it. Uh, we heard squarely, and and I've seen it throughout the pandemic, that issues of self determination need to be at the core of the discussion. Uh, federal leadership um, in the matters of 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 weeding out racism and systemic racism need to be at the top of the discussion, uh, but they need to be informed by those who have that as a lived experience on a daily basis, starting with um, the community and and the Atikamek Nation community of Manawan. It's why we've advanced financing um, to um, to the community of Manawan to, to guide us along applying a principle that is focused on um, achieving real equality uh, in the healthcare system with respect to Indigenous peoples. Uh, so it, it can take various forms. And I, I think these are, these are sort of the things as politicians, you want to kind of have control over things. And that's not helpful in this situation. We have to kind of let ourselves go 
and be open to criticism, open to change, open to feedback, um, open to to solutions that we may not be con- be comfortable with. People have asked me uh, as and, and asked Carolyn and asked Patty through um, what what are you guys going to do in the short term? Well, we have a real opportunity right now to to test what we have said we were going to do, um, and we've been we've seen the proof of it through the deployment of the vaccines, um, treating Indigenous people on a priority basis. Um, knowing what we know and our experience through the last nine months. So you want an immediate, um, you want an immediate action, make sure the vaccines get deployed in a scientifically proven way to people that are marginalized by the healthcare system in a culturally appropriate way. Um, and, 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 you know, I introduced, we introduced healthcare legislation today, but it's been on throne speeches for, for two rounds now over the past year. It's something we've been given a tremendous amount of thought over. Um, this was an occasion to to launch it and and launch the the the, the, uh, the consultation process and discussion process. Brett, do you have a follow up? Yes, just as a follow up, uh, Minister Miller, you mentioned bills C ninety one and C ninety two. What I'm wondering is if you're kind of using bills like C-92 kind of as a framework or a starting point? Is this something that you imagine will allow First Nations, Inuit, Métis to assert their own jurisdiction over health care and the provision of health care at the end of the day? Well, these will be informed by my, my our, our conversations, Brett. What I do know, um, and it's measurable through uh, the deployment of, of financial support and backing and assets that only the government of Canada can mobilize, such as the armed forces, such as uh, surge capacity that we've been, um, we've been, we've been, we've been really um, massively procuring is is that when those assets are put at the disposition, and and when the financial control over these assets um, can be exercised by First Nations, by Indigenous peoples, by Inuit and, and, and Métis, um, the outcomes are better. Uh, they just are. It's measurable. It happens. Um, and you know, I think one of the one of the real successes of the Indigenous Community Support Fund is the fact that it, it is it it allows the implementation of pandemic plans that are um, that are tailored by the community itself, and 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 the proof is there. Um, so I won't presume the outcome of these discussions. We know, uh, and when we heard it from um, from ITK President Natan Obed, self determination is key. Um, that is a when it comes to the Inuit, um, there is a different set of considerations than we would have with, um, with, uh, with with First Nations. Everyone knows that, but we have to we have to reflect that in our in our discussions. So um, that's that's my answer. I hope I hope it I hope it answers it clearly. Thanks, Brett. Operator, uh, next question, please. Thank you. The next question, la prochaine question is de Catherine Lévesque de la Presse canadienne. Please go ahead. La parole est à vous. Catherine Lévesque, Canadian Press. Yes, good afternoon to all of you. Question for Minister Miller. I wanted to continue along the same lines, and I wanted to hear him in French on the bill that con- includes agreements with uh, Indigenous peoples. What do you seek to accomplish concretely, and how will you apply the Joyce Principle and did you have an idea in mind when you tabled the bill? Well, to be very clear and to answer the question directly, I have no deadline for tabling a bill. I, I said so to Brett. When I came into this role, it was in my mandate, and there was already a, already a throne speech that announced this project. What I am seeking and what we are all seeking is true equality of indigenous peoples in the health system. We all we know very well. We are very proud of our health system in Canada. It is a, a world-class uh, system, but unfortunately, for historic reasons, colonialism, there is systemic racism against Indigenous peoples, and that makes them second and even third class citizens in the healthcare system, which is a jurisdiction which is jealously guarded by the provinces. And there are political tensions that have existed for a long time now. 
It is a minefield. We know it very well. But by knowing this, we know that we can address the issue, and we we need to do it together. We need to address racist, systemic racism at all levels of government concerning our role of the government of Canada to uh, Indigenous people. It's well enshrined in the Constitution, um, and before that as well. So in light of the bills that were tabled very differently from those in the past, I, there is C-91, the Indigenous Languages Act, and C-92, the Act on, uh, Act on Childhood Services, which refer to the tragedy imposed upon Indigenous children. It's trying to rebuild the system, to build acts in partnership with indigenous peoples. We have not reached perfection. It was very difficult, and I won't hide it. It requires commitment and engagement. But by I, when I assumed the role, I knew I wanted to take as much time as possible with my staff to conduct consultations. And so the sums announced in the uh, fiscal fall fiscal update uh, announced $15.6 million. There was urgency, obviously, because of the pandemic, around the global pandemic, and we haven't seen this in 100 years, and this means that this project, and in the light of what we've all seen about the horrible treatment against Joyce Echequan, which is all too common experienced by Indigenous peoples, there is urgency to establish and accelerate this process. That being said, we will need to continue the consultation and dialogue with partners, with indigenous peoples who are claiming this right, a right to self-determination over their own uh, management of their health system, systems that have been underfunded in the past. It's, it's a federal responsibility. And we talk a lot about provincial responsibility we see it a lot, and what happens in urban areas, it's unacceptable. There's a lot of work to be done. It falls to the federal government as well. Let's not hide it. All of these elements mean that we will take the time to do things right. The tabling of the bill and the presenting of the bill is won't be done tomorrow. We will do things properly. We know that there is urgency. I know that people will ask, what will we do in light of the discussions over of the past two days? In our own fields of jurisdiction, we have the uh, vaccine deployment that is ethical for uh, indigenous peoples, which is done in hand-in-hand in hand with the provinces and territories. And we will need to prove ourselves to indigenous peoples because so far things have been successful. But there are many vaccines to be deployed, as you've seen in the last three days concerning vaccines vaccines entering the country, but we need to do it across our health system, and we need to seek justice and parity for everyone, and in urgent cases, well, to answer, it's a long answer to your question, but we know that Indigenous people are more susceptible to COVID, and that's something that they, and so they must be prioritized. Is there a follow-up question? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for the response. You said yourself that you're in a minefield and we're talking about the provincial jurisdiction in health care. And you mentioned over the last two days that some of the provinces have reacted to say that the federal government is treading on their jurisdiction. Are there province, some provinces that reacted more strongly than others? It remains to be seen. For elected officials, it's time to listen. And... Uh, we spoke at the end of the day today, but we were there to listen to their experiences, so I don't think it was the place for anyone to make sweeping political statements. I felt openness. 
from Quebec Minister Yann Lafrenière presented his commitment to fight racism. I take him at his word. I think he's in good faith, but there is a lot of work to do. And what Indigenous peoples have been saying to us constantly is that we need to prove ourselves. I was very touched by Minister Dick's comments about BC, who said that uh, they need to prove themselves. They need to improve point of care. People, their first experience with the health care system when they're in distress, and that's work that needs to be done. Catherine, I know maybe Minister Bennett or Minister Haidu might wish to add to that, but that was my impression. That's good. Mute button. I had it in French, but Joyce's principle, just to remind people, and it is what we believe, um, that, that Indigenous people have an equal right to the highest standard of physical and mental health with a right to traditional medicines and the conservation of their vital med medicinal plants, animals, and minerals. It says that governments must recognize indigenous rights to autonomy and self-determination in matters of health and social services. So I think that's in some ways a little bit being able to assert um, their jurisdiction in the way that, that C92 does. Merci, Catherine. Uh, operator, prochaine question. Thank you, Catherine. Operator, next question. Thank you. The next question, la prochaine question is de Mike Lecouture from Global News. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Um, thanks for this. Minister Miller, I, I know a couple of other colleagues have sort of danced around. I just wanted to ask you really pointedly. You said yesterday that Canadians expect concrete answers. Stop calling things out. So from what happened over the last two days, what is actually going to turn into concrete measures to help Indigenous people trust the health care system again? Yeah, and thanks, Mike. It's important. Um, you know, it's if we had if people had a solution tomorrow, um, it would be, it would be a, an entire misunderstanding of of the scope of the problem. Um, and, and clearly, what we heard today, and, and as I mentioned to, to Catherine Levesque in, in, in French, it, this was time for us to continue in our listening to those that have experiences that I personally have never had at all with respect to the healthcare system because I get the benefit of a first class healthcare system. Indigenous people don't. It's often second or third. Um, so we did <laughs> make um, announcements with respect to supporting the community of Manawan um, in, in, in the sum of $2 million to work on Joyce's principle and concrete solutions that they would like to see. Um, Mr. Haidu announced another $4 million to uh, to support uh, indigenous organizations and physicians um, in, in, in a number of their initiatives and pushing forward um, the actions that they would like to take. Uh, for me, in, in my uh, ministry, I announced, and it, I wouldn't say it was breaking news because we talked about it in two throne speeches, but uh, the launch of an in, incredibly important um, piece of legislation that will take some time to put together in terms of distinctions-based healthcare legislation for indigenous peoples um, but that will take time. Um, the the immediate the immediate challenge and and the immediate um, rollout of the vaccines in a way that reflects uh, what we say the healthcare system should reflect re reflect is, is is absolutely top of mind to me. So far, with in terms of the prioritizations that have been made by the NA, 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 NAC, sorry, it's getting along in the day, Mike uh, NACI. Um, the provinces have been have been pretty good in in prioritizing indigenous peoples, and we've seen that roll out into communities. Sometimes with real logistical challenges. With in the case of northern and remote communities, the objective, which is still on track, of getting uh, both doses into arms by the end of March for 75% of the populations in the territories, which, which who are exceedingly vulnerable, uh, not only in their uh, the, not not only in the fragility of their healthcare system, um, but the ability in the conditions of 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 of, um, of of a housing deficit uh, 
and cramped housing conditions to have the virus spread like wildfire um, with, with, with real mortal consequences. And these aren't, this isn't imaginary data. We can see it, what's happening in the States with numbers from 3.5 to five times the impact of COVID on, on Indigenous peoples with a mortality rate um, that the CDC is quoting at 1.8 to 2 to Indigenous peoples and even at younger ages. So um, we're, we're, we're worried about that and, we're, and Indigenous peoples even more so as they're composing with odds that are far greater than non-Indigenous populations. Now, um, from their perspective, facing a hundred year, um, once in a hundred year epidemic, um, the proof is in the pudding and getting that, uh, getting, getting those vaccines into arms in a, in a culturally safe manner. So people talk about short-term um, deliverables um, this, this will be a chance for Indigenous peoples to evaluate uh, the words that we've said and judge us accordingly. Um, I know from my experience of, even though I have never experienced the issues that have been discussed over the last two years, that, uh, that, that when Indigenous peoples have the assets and resources um, and, and the assistance of the federal government in a respectful way, the, the results uh, are, are there to prove it throughout COVID. And that's I could get into a lot of the stuff that we've done during COVID, um, knowing that there is much more to do. But um, I say that because the issue of self-determination over over um, over healthcare is is key, um, key foremost um, as a matter of right, but also as a matter of uh, positive medical outcomes to a community, the communities that that, that face uh, lower socio determinants of health in um, what we all believe and what I believe to be the best country in the world. I'd just like to add that, you know, through uh, Patty's department and the public health agency, that that the National Collaborating Center on Indigenous Health is really uh, going to be the repository for all of the wise practices in, in, in cultural safety, cultural humility. I think a lot of people really like the video that they they um, showed us to today, both days during the break, but that was released last week on stigma and discrimination and, and what that means. And so I think that there is this ability for us to lift up what is happening across the country. Nobody has to start from scratch. And, and the kind of competencies that all healthcare institutions, all healthcare providers need to understand is something that, that we can we can support but then it will be up to the individual institutions and and healthcare providers and and centers and hospitals to to really put it in place. And if I can, oh, yeah, sorry for a follow up. I was just going to say, picking up on what you were uh, saying there, Minister Miller, about the rollout of the vaccine. How much pressure are you putting on yourself? And at the same time, how big of an issue is it to have a proper and a safe rollout of this vaccine to not only counter that history of mistrust in the healthcare system, but possibly take steps to repair that and maybe move on to the road of reconciliation with this moment in time and this vaccine rollout? Well, Mike, I'm I'm really cautious about drawing any great conclusions about how we've done things at this point. We're still in the middle of a pandemic, and I, I wake up every day, and I, I know that's the case for Patty and 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 Carolyn, wondering how we can do things faster. Um, the um, the deployment of the vaccine is 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 I think top of mind for every single cabinet minister. Um, and in, in my portfolio and the one that touches Carolyn and, and Dan Vandals on a pretty much a daily basis, getting that into Indigenous communities presents a set of logistical challenges that, uh, that aren't present in, in, in other in non-Indigenous communities or in a, in a, in a big urban centre. I, I, I do worry about the Indigenous populations there, but that's a, 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 that's a challenge in itself with, with, um, with uh, provincial healthcare systems. Um, we are, you know, one of the one of the key assets that we've um, brought to bear during this pandemic, which is the result of some novel thinking, is ensuring that the the, the assets and the logistical force of the Canadian Armed Forces, where um, where 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 all the plans start to to fall apart when the, when 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 COVID really gets into a community, well, the armed forces can step in and help, um, but that takes an that that takes an immense amount of planning, 
Uh, my biggest hope is that we'll actually learn something about this coming out from the pandemic. Um, Minister Haidu and I spoke about this today. We, we really have to learn some lessons about how we've deployed our assets and how we've served Indigenous communities um, according to the oaths we all took when, when, when getting into office, but also as a matter of human nature. And um, that involves um, trusting voices on the ground when they say, hey, we've got a problem, we got to move. Um, there's, a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of red tape that needs to be, get cleared between the time someone says, hey, we need some help. Um, our pandemic plan isn't working despite all our best efforts. Can you come in and help us? And the time we deploy, for example, the armed forces and, and time, if you wait one or two days, a case can go from five or 10 to 200 and 300 and, and, and whole communities shut down, which isn't surprising because you can, you can shut down big cities, frankly, if COVID gets out of hand. Um, so uh, there are a number of lessons over trusting people that, um, that, that are telling you what's going on on the ground. Um, working hand in hand, constant communication with chiefs and council and health authorities, making sure the most up to date information is getting into communities. That's that's a huge, huge challenge for us um, as we deploy the vaccine. Working against um, legitimate fear of the healthcare system in terms of uh, vaccines and 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 deployment of the vaccines in a culturally safe fashion, um, leveraging assets, leveraging people and and the elders showing the way and using their languages to 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 give people the full complement of information so they can take an informed choice as to whether to get the vaccine. So far, we've been really pleasantly surprised. There's, we're, we're, we're playing with conservative estimates of, of, of doses, but I would say there's been about, um, it's closing in on about 40,000 um, 40, vaccine doses that have been administered um, in and around 100, closing in on 200 communities um, with, with many clinics being planned over the next couple of weeks. And, and that's pretty impressive given the limited supply. Most of them are Moderna, uh, but in some closer uh, areas with um, with ultra low freezing capacity, uh, the Pfizer option is being deployed as well. Um, but that's a whole logistical challenge that uh, I think we wake up every day saying, hey, what's, what's going on and how can we help and how can we get um, things out faster and quicker and um, in a way that's respectful. Thanks, Mike. Uh, operator, next question. Thank you. Merci. The next question, la prochaine question is de Mackenzie Gray from CTV. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi there. My questions are for Minister Haidu. Um, Minister, with all the confusion today about five doses in a vial or six doses in a vial, has Pfizer given you any assurances that if Health Canada says, nope, we're sticking with five doses in a vial, that they will come through and give us four million doses? Or are we going to end up with only 3.5 million, uh, which is what the provinces were told earlier today? Oh, well, thanks, Mackenzie. Um, as you know, uh, sorry, I'm getting a bit of a reverb here. <laughs> so, as you know, Mackenzie, um, the Major General Fortin gave this update to earlier today. Uh, we are having conversations with the manufacturer, and this uh, this decision is still under review with Health Canada. So you don't know from Pfizer whether or not, if Canada ends up saying we're sticking with five uh, doses in a vial, what the delivery schedule is going to look like? Because it seems like Pfizer is going ahead with six doses, regardless of what Canada ends up saying. I'm not going to speculate at this point, uh, Mackenzie. The Health Canada regulators are doing their import work, and um, the conversations with Pfizer are ongoing. Thanks, Mackenzie. Uh, operator, next question, please. Thank you. Merci. The next question, la prochaine question, is de Joan Bryden from the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Yeah, Hi, Masters. <clears throat> I'm just wondering, um, you've all referred to what you've heard over the last two days and how moving it was. Tell us a little bit about the things that moved you the most. Maybe I'll start, Joan, and I'll, I'll send it over to my colleague. Um, and to the technicians in the room, if you can stop the reverb, that would be much easier for my thinking process. Um, I'll, one of the most moving pieces, I think, for me, and maybe it's because I've given birth to two children, but the repeated reference to the trauma that Indigenous women face in trying to give birth 
uh, well, first of all, not in many cases being able to give birth in community, um, having to give birth often far away from loved ones, family, disrupt any kind of um, any kind of cultural uh, any kind of cultural process that might go along with giving birth in that community, and then the fear and anxiety of obviously what will happen to them and their children, along with the combined anxiety around child apprehension. I think those stories, I don't think anyone can listen to those stories and not just have a great deal of grief for the women that go through this and continue to, by the way, most women in Northern Ontario do have to fly into um, uh, larger centers to give birth to their children and it, it, and it is divorced from community and often from a ceremony that would go along with giving birth in a in a, in a community setting. So that's, I think, one area that is very touching to me. And it's certainly not new to hear those stories, but I think every time I hear those stories, especially when people share their own personal experiences, it's very, very poignant. I, I think for me, um, the stories compound uh, what I mentioned in my opening remarks, that this isn't, um, I, I should, you know, listen, racism is horrible, but it's not, it's not, uh, it's not an uncommon occurrence. It happens, uh, to Indigenous people, regardless of their own social location, regardless of their own particular status in their community or in the community in which they find themselves. This is, this happens every day to Indigenous people in a million small and large ways. So much so that the Indigenous people that I worked with in community um, often sought uh, alternatives to traditional care. So, you know, for example, if there was an underground, uh, some, you know, person who had a little bit of nursing experience, they might seek care from someone that they trusted would treat them with kindness and with respect and with compassion, who maybe didn't have the skills to actually deal with that level of care over a medical system where they would uh, and had experienced severe exclusion in, and violence in some cases. And so uh, those kinds of stories that compound those, those histories, I think, are also very difficult to hear. And, and, you know, oftentimes when we're hearing from Indigenous practitioners, what we're hearing are um, the need to hide their indigeneity, if you will. And I think one of, uh, one of our speakers talked about that, the need to put on essentially a white mask to make it in a world where being Indigenous and Indigenous ways of knowing Indigenous ways of medicine, Indigenous ways of healing are not only not taught, but they're not even really accepted. And so this need to sort of walk in this second land, if you will, uh, and negate, you know, parts of them that are really integral to their own, to their own identity. Uh, those are, are also very painful to hear. I uh, I think uh, as well that the you know the the death of uh, Silatik Gudvik um, who had to come out of Nunavut uh, to give birth and then died of COVID um, was very much part of what we heard yesterday from Pautudik, but what we heard at their annual general meeting this has been uh, really upsetting as as the the birthing center in Rankin has had to be closed. This is uh, people want their children born in their communities and their elders able to die in their communities. And, and that we, we seem to be in the way of that. Um, and in a sort of colonial way, I think I've had the privilege of meeting with the indigenous physicians uh, every Thursday night since March. I think that all of them have had such poignant personal stories that we heard in October. But, you know, Dr. Lana Potts, for her to be advocating for her patients to actually describe what happened to her as a patient, but also what happened to her in medical school, that this 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 is why it's so poignant and why people think you know they've heard all these words before nothing changes and and i think that 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 these meetings really no one's saying that it doesn't exist anymore everybody knows it does exist and they look at the the outcomes and the and the suicide rates and the ability 
uh, you know, for for people to just, as we've said, not really want to go to hospital because they had such a terrible time last time. And then by the time they do access care, they're way, way sicker than they, they should have been. So I think that we it is about raising the awareness and and also understanding that from the colleges of physicians and surgeons to accreditation canada what happens when something bad happens <laughs> uh are there consequences and i think that 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 all of the accreditation bodies and colleges and and are are now really deciding they better look at this in it, it this is uh this is just not safe system for Indigenous people at the moment. And I, I guess my view that I've been reflecting over the course of the two meetings is, is just, you know, we're talking of the people that were, have been talking about their experiences, um, particularly in the medical profession, professions, the doctors and nurses, highly trained individuals. Um, they've had to cut, rise up out of conditions that were unacceptable um, to become the cream of the crop. Um, it, it takes pretty good grades to go to med school. Um, I know, I know Carolyn went, I, <laughs> I had it, I probably didn't have much of a shot, but you know, it, it, it you, this is, we're talking about the cream of the crop of society. Um, and when it talks about indigenous peoples overcoming obstacles to get there, they are great, uh, they are immense. Um, and they face racism and systemic systemic racism every step of the way. You know, someone like Donna May um, Kimberly Arjic was the first indigenous uh, cardiac surgeon uh, and, and a doctor who is at the Cleveland Clinic. So, you know, one, one of the foremost institutions in the world still faces these things. And this was the lived experience of many of the doctors that were talking to us about a Medicare system that I, I feel is the best in the world. Um, and those are the, you know, th these are the lucky ones educated that have faced the challenges, that are the ones uh, that have peers that are treating other people like garbage. Um, and I, I took some time to think about why I was thinking about those that were um, really the exceptional ones that were being treated and why I was reacting more strongly to those um, than everyone else initially. And then it, it brings it, I, I, it brings it back to, to what, um, what someone like Joyce Echequan faced who didn't have familiarity with the medical system and is actually the patient and is that their most vulnerable and is being treated uh, in a racist fashion um, and is suffering the effects of systemic racism, reverts to her own language, which a lot of us do in our moments of vulnerability. Um, you know, you, you think about, there was a story in the news two years ago about uh, the transportation of um, in a children to the to the south um, and the, the the I'm not pointing fingers. Uh, the, the 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 health minister at the time in Quebec had said, and perhaps clumsily because he was expressing himself in, a, in, in not his not not his language but in English about um, the adults that would have been let on board and no accompaniment. Um, and and he said something about substance abuse um, and and regretted it obviously and apologized, but he he hasn't expressed himself. And he said this was not his language and rightfully presented his apologies. And 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 that you know I think that was fixed. And now there are people that accompany their children to the south. But for a lot of kids, that's their first interaction with the healthcare system, um, being vulnerable in their own language. Um, and think about all those kids that were on the plane and had to go into a care system and, and be vulnerable and not be able to express themselves properly. So that's a real repercussion of those that don't have the benefits. So I, I guess I was sort of drawing that parallel saying there's, there's a heck of a lot of work to do. Um, we know it. Um, and there's still mistakes being made. We know it. It's in the reports. I, I, it's my belief every province should probably uh, turn out a report such as the one that Marilyn Prelefont did in BC because they probably have um, substantially similar conclusions. Um, but these stories are are, are there. Um, they're important, but they also do guide our reflection and how we move forward. So I, I, I think the focus, because it was people that are working at the point of care for the course of the last two meetings, there's a lot structural that we need to do, obviously, but did focus on point of care. Um, but it boils down to 
dignity, respect, and, um, and, and, and equal treatment. Joan, did you have a follow-up? No, it's good. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Joan. Um, and we have time for one more question, operator. The next question, la prochaine question est de Olivia Stefanovic from CBC News. Please go ahead. La parole est à vous. Hi, ministers. With the development of this new Indigenous health legislation, does this mean Métis will begin receiving federal health coverage and have their prescriptions covered, for example? Hi, Olivia. I can't give you an answer right now. Um, these, these are always these are discussions that we will have to have. I, I'm aware. I'm familiar with um, a lot of the criticism of um, NIB in particular by by um, uh, by the Métis National Council. Uh, and, and so these are you know we need to be informed uh, moving forward on on what the Daniels case, the Supreme Court, which is a recent Supreme Court judgment, said um, and the implications that it has. Uh, but those are discussions that we will need to have with um, the appropriate rights holder uh, of the Métis. So um, I won't give you a, an answer on that. Olivia, do you have a follow-up? Yes. Uh, and with, with the creation of this legislation, does that mean that your department is moving towards dismantling the First Nations and Inuit Health Branch? Well, it... it if you recall the history of um, of FNIB, it only recently moved over um, to uh, Indigenous Services Canada as it was housed in um, in Health Canada. Prior to that, uh, there, there's still work to do within our department to to make it um, or to, to transform it in, in, into um, what what Indigenous peoples expect of it. Um, but I, I most certainly wouldn't uh, at all signal a dismantlement of it. 